can't put a tall person before me. That just makes me. You know, okay. Just keeping me humble right there, you know. Tall guy, he's so handsome, and then I gotta come up here and say some stuff. Jesus keeps me humble, you know. Uh, I have to acknowledge Omar Terranciel, you know, some OGs in the house. Who's on the original Paris mission team with us. Uh, somebody who is near and dear. Now he's got a wife. Good for him. God is good. <laughs> he's very good. Uh, Eddie, Eddie Alvarado. Um, Eddie Avocado. You know, he was, he, was a, he was a teen worker in the ICOC. And, and um, my brother was baptized under his tutelage. He's a large reason why I'm faithful today. So I'm very grateful for you, Eddie. You are an unsung hero in the kingdom of God. You're, you're what the kingdom is built on. The, the kingdom is not built on people like me who stand on the stage. It's, it's all the people who are, who are quiet and doing the work of discipleship that build the kingdom of God. People like Eddie Alvarado. Now, we do need leaders as well. And he's a leader in a different way. We need both sides of the coin. Nobody is greater or worse in this church. We must value both sides. You know, to be honest, I never wanted to leave the South region, you know, if I can be. I remember one time I, I was preaching a sermon, and my sermon was right before special missions, and I go, everybody's going somewhere, and you're going to go, maybe you go on this mission team, and maybe we'll go this, this place one day, and then I got off the stage, and uh, Kip was in the region at the time, and we were in transition, so they were kind of our disciples, Kip and Elena. He goes, what are you talking about? Some people aren't going anywhere, so you need to preach a different sermon next week. We get back to the next week. We got our hearts right. I repented. And I go, we don't want to go anywhere ever. We're going to stay in the South region for the next hundred years. We're going to have a, 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 our firstborn son's going to be, his name is going to be Carson, you know, because that's in here in the, the South region. We're going to have a dog and he's going to be called LBCC. It's going to be so incredible. You know, two weeks later. We have region leaders meeting. I got good news for you, Anthony. You're going back to Europe. Oh, bro, you just told me I was staying in Long Beach forever. And now I'm going back on the mission field. And uh, my wife and I have been on the mission field for 12 years now. So it's, it's been a long time. I am special missions. You know, I am special missions. I am from, from La Puente, California. Mi gente. Okay. And so, you know, I, I joke all the time that the Mexicans started coming into South, Southern California. I wasn't a minority anymore. There's all Mexicans here. Then they go, you're going to Paris, France. I'm a minority again. What the heck is going on here? And so we've been on the mission field and we've given up job. We've given up home. We've given up family. We've given up so many things for the kingdom of God. Yet I hold all those things that we have sacrificed as worthy of being sacrificed for our King and our Savior and for what God is doing here in the L.A. church. And I, was, I heard a story about a guy on his way home. It inspired me. So there was a guy on his way home. He got to the end of the road, and he didn't know where to go. The road split into four uh, uh, segments there, okay? So you can go here, 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 here. And, and, and the road or the path that was all the way over here, there was a dead monkey on that path. And then right next to him, that, that, the dead monkey was an overweight bald guy on that path. And then there was a guy in a robe with a big beard, and he was dead on that path. And then there was a guy beaming with light and floating on that path. And the guy, who do you think the guy asked for directions? He asked Jesus for directions. And you see, what, what makes us special is we're the only religion that worships a living God. You see, atheism worships dead monkeys. You see, Buddhism worships a dead overweight guy. Islam worships a false prophet who is also dead. But we worship the living Jesus. Yet, do you know him today? He asked him for direction because that's the only way. Jesus is the only way. The way to live, the way to get to heaven. But to know Jesus is to obey him. You know, I was baptized in the teen ministry, so I'm kind of, I'm kind of a Pharisee of Pharisees. You know, you ask everybody, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Everything's fantastic. I'm fired up in the kingdom of God. And I just think to myself, you're a Pharisee and you're lying. Nobody is always that fired up. Sometimes there's problems. Can I get an amen on problems? 
I love Jeremy Charmilla. Is it want to get this off here? This is a problem. People don't like this, but I'm. But je suis uh, français maintenant, et donc. Uh, I need my I need my Perrier. I'm sorry if if my thick accent. We've been in Paris for a long time. If you can't understand me, I apologize. Back to Jeremy. Jeremy's awesome. I go, Jeremy, how's everything going? Well, I've had better days. Jesus is still Lord. I go, amen, real people in the kingdom of God. I love that. To know him is to obey him. And I was, uh, I was inspired by great poets and philosophers of the 90s, the band Fastball. And they had a song called The Way. And then the chorus of the song goes, where were they going without ever knowing the way? Okay. And really, there's a lot of Christians. Where are you going if you don't know the way? The people in the world, where are you going if you don't know the way? And that's the title of my sermon. Where are you going if you don't know the way? Point number one. You're going to get bitter if you don't know the way. You ever go, you're going to, you're going to like a, a, we say in French, a rendezvous. You have a, you have a meeting that you're going to, and then all of a sudden there's a crash on the freeway. And then all of a sudden your, your GPS conks out. And then all of a sudden you feel that temptation inside of your heart, like, what the heck is going on? Everybody's against me. And there's this temptation to get bitter or to go, God is in control of this situation. I'm going to stay a disciple. I know Jesus. He's going to lead the way. Turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. I hope you like the Bible. I was told this is a Bible church. (laughs) Give me a hallelujah when you get to 2 Kings chapter 4. It's right after 1 Kings. You're welcome. It says in verse 38, no, before I start, okay, I'm going to call Elisha, Elisha. I know that some people call him Elisha, but if you look at it in Hebrew, it's Elisha. So Elisha is a closer transliteration of the name. And Elijah is actually Eliyahu, so it's Eliyahu and Elisha. So I, again, I don't want to get into theological debates over the name, but I don't want to throw people off as I read the name of not Elisha, but Elisha. Amen? You still love me? Am I okay? Okay. I saw some, I saw some, I saw some brothers with the NIV 2011 pick up a stone. Um, 84 is in the house. It says, Elisha returned to Gilgal where there was a famine in the region. I pray there's no famine in your region today. A famine is a, is a representation of mis- the, the, the word of God was not around. And so they were not having any fruit in that time. While the company of prophets, now there could, you can have a company of prophets and still have a fruitless time in your life. Can I get an amen? amen. I've been there. It says they were having a meeting. And then Elisha said to the servant, put on a large pot and cook some stew for these men. And that's what you do when you're at the brother's household. You got, you know, you know, nothing really to eat, but you just grab all the random stuff. You put it in a pot and you call it stew. That was the, that was the Tim Kernan uh, classic. What are we having? We're having stew. And they're, they're, they're just random stuff. There was pizza in there and hot dogs in there. And, and we just... Said to pray. Jesus led us. It says, one of them went out in the field, they started gathering herbs and found a wild vine. Now, the herbs of the Old Testament, they kind of represent something. When you go back to the Passover, they had the bitter herbs. And so it represented their bitter time that they had when they were in slavery. And what happens when you're not close to God, what, what, where do you go? You go to bitterness. And, and then it says that there was the wild vine. And so why do we get bitter? Because you're wild. You're wild and you don't want to have God's authority in your life. Jesus says, I am the vine. Israel was the vine, but then they became a wild vine. And so this was a a, a foreshadowing or, or a sermon at them with a really great illustration. It says, he gathered some of the gourds and filled up the, the fold of his cloak. When he returned, uh, cut, up what, uh, cut it up and put it in the pot of stew. 
No one knew what they were about to eat. Verse 40. The stew was poured out before the men. As they began to eat, they cried out, Oh, man of God, there's death in this pot. I can relate. And, and what happens when you're bitter and wild? Death. Death all around you. Your ministry doesn't grow. Your marriage doesn't grow. Your family doesn't grow. You don't get stronger. You don't get more encouraged. Death in the pot. Elisha said, get some flour, put it in the pot, serve it to the people so that they can eat, and then there was nothing harmful in the pot. Well, what is flour? Flour is used to make bread. And so what did Jesus do with bread? He broke the bread and he gave it to the people. It was a symbol of him breaking his life. What is, what is flour? It's just wheat that's ground it up. And so this symbolizes that God's people were not dying to themselves anymore. He was saying, you need to be ground up. You need to be like powder. You're going to fall on the rock, or the rock is going to fall on you. But if you make yourself nothing, I can take away all your bitterness. But you need to make yourself nothing today. You know what stands in the way of God doing great things in your life? You're too prideful to get open today. But there are some humble people, and I think that you will get open today. Amen to that? Yeah, well, you guys are radical. Yeah, they're, they're prideful. I'm prideful. Amen. Let, some people want to repent, too. I like you guys. You guys are awesome. We continue to read. There's more bread analogies. It says a man came from Baal. He came from Banduse, okay? He came from Baal Shalisha, bringing, bringing the man of God 20 loaves of barley bread, break from the first ripe grain, along with some heads of new grain. Give it to the people so that they can eat, Elisha said. Now, he brings in 20 loaves of bread. Now, for again, what, what does bread represent in the Bible? It's Jesus, the bread of life. It's his word. Can I get an amen? Are we okay there? And so then we have, a, we have some numbers. We're going to talk about just a little a touch of numerology. I hope I don't lose anybody if you're not a mathematician. And, and 20 is 5 times 4. Are we good? Are we still good there? 5 is a representation of the Old Testament, the first five books of the Bible. Okay? And then, and then 4 is kind of the representation of the New Testament or of all nations. Okay, who did Jesus feed first? The 5,000, and then he fed the 4,000. First to the Jew, and then to the Gentile. First to the Jew, and then to all nations. So you have the 4 times 5, get to 20. And so it's basically like the Old Testament, the New Testament. You, you, get the, you get the word in your life. And then, so he gives the word, he gives the word to the people, or to the attendant. He says, feed the people. And then he says, how can I? There's like 100 people here. So the number 100 is 10 times 10. 10 represents God's authority in your life, like the Ten Commandments and many others, a million other 10s I won't go through for the sake of time. So 10 times 10. And so 10 times 10 is like ultimate authority. And so God was saying to his people, you need my authority in your life again to be blessed. He says, Elisha answered, give it to the people to eat, for this is what the Lord says. They will eat and they will have leftover. They said it before them, and they ate, and there was some leftover according to the word of the Lord. You know what happens when you, don't, you give up on bitterness? You know what happens when you decide to be humble? God gives you abundance. When you accept his authority in your life, he gives you abundance. He gives you a better job. You know, some of you can't handle a better job. If he gave you a million today, you'd fall away. And so he's waiting for you to get full authority so he can bless you the way he really wants to bless you. You know, I, I've been tempted to be bitter. Any, anybody tempted with bitterness in your life? I've been tempted to be bitter in my life. My wife, my wife raised all her limbs. She levitated. She's like, I'm married to Anthony. I've been tempted with bitterness. You know, my, my dad's a drug dealer. Uh, he's still, he's kind of a retired mafioso, and so there was a lot of times where I was like, who could I have been if this guy wasn't such a deadbeat? Like, those, those are the evil thoughts in my mind instead of being, no, bro, you're a disciple. Sometimes I call myself bro when I'm discipling myself, you know, <laughs> bro. <laughs> Sometimes God calls me bro, bro. I'm like, <laughs> that's a scary one. <laughs> and, and I just, I, 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 no, you're a disciple. You, you got to forgive. Like, why, why are you going to hold that against them? You, you, you know the truth. You know, my, my, my mom essentially chose a man over her children. And she kind of abandoned us at a, at a later stage in life. And I was so tempted to be bitter, just so tempted to be angry at her. 
And, and what I realized is, again, it's like the old saying, bitterness is like drinking poison and expecting somebody else to die. And, and, and what I realized is I was bitter at God. You see, you're not bitter at your situation. You're bitter at God. You're not bitter at a person. You're bitter at God. Who, who put you in the situation? Who gave you that discipler? Who allowed, who allowed all the persecution? Who, 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 who's the one in control of everything? Is it... Is, in, in, in Espanol, Dios, ¿sí? So when I'm bitter, you are really ultimately bitter at God and God alone. Bitterness is a forgiveness issue. It's a you issue. It's not the other person. It's not the situation. You know, Cassidy and I, uh, we tried to have children. We had three miscarriages on the mission field. Um, two of those miscarriages, Cassidy almost died. Uh, once was in Paris, and she was trying to go to, to Campus Evil. Well, Cassidy's radical. She's like having internal bleeding, and she's like, I want to go to Campus Evil. Like, Cass, let's go to the doctors. Let's have Campus Evil there. And, and, and we, got, we got to the doctors, and they said, you're going to die if we don't get you an emergency surgery now. And so we're wheeling, you know, Cassidy into surgery, and she's singing Kingdom God. Thank you, Lord, for loving me, and thank you. She's singing Kingdom songs into the operating room. Because there's a temptation. Are you gonna get? Are you gonna get bitter? Or are you gonna get better? Are you gonna humbly accept the situation? Even when, let me tell you something. If you're a disciple, life is not fair. If you want life to be fair, you don't really want to be a Christian. Like, if you want to be understood, if you want to be understood, you don't really want to be a Christian. Jesus was the most misunderstood. So to be like Jesus is to be misunderstood and to be cheated. And so Cassidy's going into, she's going into surgery, misunderstood and mistreated and, you know, very, very challenging situation. And amen, she makes it out alive, but lost one of her fallopian tubes. We go out on the mission, t uh, mission field again. We're in Kiev, Ukraine. She has another miscarriage and almost dies a second time. So we make a decision, okay, we're just going to have to be humble. And, and we mourn the death of her womb. We're just not going to have kids. And some people, no, oh, no, they, they come over to my wife to put their hand on her. Don't worry, God is going to bless you. L listen, Jesus didn't have kids, okay? Paul didn't have kids. If this is what I need to accept in my life, I will accept it for his glory. Don't, wor don't, don't take pity on me for things I'm not taking pity on myself. And so we humbled ourselves. And, okay, this is our lot in life. Let's, let's adopt a dog. And so we got ourselves a little Frenchie. His name is Jacques Croissant. Cassidy wanted Croissant. And in Espanol, it would be Santiago Pan Dulce, okay? Because Jacques, Jacques is James, and also Santiago is James. And, and so, you know, Santiago Pan Dulce. And, and so Jacques won one night, you know, after a long day in the ministry. You know, we take him out on the mission field. We, he's in a Bible study. He comes to church. You know, people go, people go, is he a service dog? Absolutely. He's at service every single Sunday. He's a service dog, for sure. For sure he's a service dog. My dog's more of a service dog than you are, so. I didn't see you last week. <laughs> and so, and so we, we have a long day in the ministry, and, 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 and his back legs stop working. He, and, and, and he starts going into, like, a lot of pain. And he's dragging himself with his front paws across our living room. And Cassidy gasps. She goes, he's got IVDD, which is like this disease that Frenchies get. And there's that temptation to get bitter again. We just, like, God, we're on the mission field. And, 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 and then we, we give up everything, and then we can't have kids, and you're going to take our dog too? Like, that's not fair. And he goes, it's not supposed to be fair. Do you accept my will or not? We, we don't sleep very much that night. We, we go out and uh, we have to call emergency services and they come and they uh, give an injection to, to kind of ease the pain. It, he has a bad reaction to it. And they say, you need to get him to the, the clinic now or he's going to die. And so, thank you, bro. Um, so we get about four in the morning. We hadn't slept at all. We get to the clinic and they make us wait a couple of hours. And then we finally get to the person who wants to take a look at our dog and they, and they take a look at the dog, and, and now we're close to 6 in the morning, again, no sleep. And they go, yeah, if we do nothing, your dog's going to die. It's just like deadpan. If we do nothing, your dog's going to die. And if we do the surgery, uh, it's going to cost 4,000 euros right now. 
And um, so yeah, if you wanna if you want him to live, you're gonna pay us that. And then if he dies on the table, you're gonna have to pay another 400 euros to shock him back to life. Because if you don't pay the extra money right now and you have to check the little box, then then he's going to you know die if 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 you don't. And then they said, also, you have to pay us even if he does die on the operating table. And then also, if he lives, he only has a 40% chance to live. If he lives, uh, he may never walk again. And so, again, it's just like, there's this temptation. Like, real temptation. You know what I mean? We get home. We left him there, obviously, for a surgery. We slept for like two hours. I don't know if you've been under stress. You don't get a lot. Of, you need sleeping. You don't get it. We slept for two hours. I wake up bawling, bawling. My wife is bawling. And I just, I'm staring at this. You ever have those moments with yourself? You're like staring at the ceiling and it's like, there's two ways to go. I'm going to crawl into a ball and die. Or I'm going to live. And I'm going to follow the way of Jesus. I rolled my carcass out of bed. And I said, Cassidy, I'm going to have me a Bible study ready for you as soon as I'm done with my quiet time. When you're done with your quiet time, you put on your best dress, you get some makeup, we are going on a prayer walk, we're going to have the de a deep time for the ages, we're going to go share our faith, we're going to go to a nice restaurant, we are going to celebrate the will of God. We had a deep time together, and I said, Cassidy, you know, some people, they want to fast from food, we're not going to fast from food today, we're going to fast from fear, doubt, and negativity. And, and we made a decision. We just made a decision. And you know, we got to church the next day, and you know how the disciples are awesome. No, you don't have to preach, Anthony. I know everything. And I go, I am preaching the word of God today. I got a, I got a message on my heart. And you know what's the result of that, man? God just bulletproofs your mind, your heart, your soul. God makes you so strong. And to see what God has done in the Paris church. You know, we started that church with eight disciples. Now we're over 164 disciples. And now we're splitting into four churches. You know, God's authority in your life, if you will accept it, will give you abundance. And that's what God has done for me and Cassidy. If you do not accept his authority, even through the times that are not fair, you're just going to get bitter. And you know... You know, on, on the analogy of, you know, the guy looking for, for the, the way to go, you know the worst play, person to get uh, advice from or direction from is a fall away? You know, if the blind leads the blind, they're both going to fall into a pit. Yeah, there are some people who want to look online from fallaways. Losers. Yeah, these people are losers. They lose souls. They do not win souls. These people, they couldn't lead five people out of a paper bag, and you want to listen to them? You know, 2 Timothy, don't turn there, just note some stuff. I, God put a Bible study inside of my Bible study. The first point got a little bit longer this morning as I heard about some people listening to some not-so-wise people online. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, we know the scripture, there are going to be terrible times in the last days. People will be traitors. Why would you go to a trader for advice or direction? You know, in the Second World War, would I go, hey, I'm, I'm struggling with direction. Let me ask the Nazis. You know, I, I heard the Nazis have a little bit more information. Let me, let me get some information from the Nazis. Yet you will tolerate getting advice from somebody who fell away, who doesn't know how to lead his wife, doesn't know how to lead his kids, yet you want to follow him? Let's go to Proverbs 26. Bonus scriptures. Bonus scriptures. I like you guys. You guys like the Bible. I could, I could be here. Man, man, the, the Woody, either you guys are doing a great job on the Woodies or they're doing a great job on you. Maybe it's a little bit of both. Probably a little bit of both. I could preach here all day. I, I won't. I won't, okay? I promise. First point will be a little long. I'll, 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 I'll even out the other ones. Kick me in the face, bro. No. Yeah. Proverbs 26, starting in verse 6. You know who's a fool? Anyone who falls away. Yeah. It's foolish. Yeah. It says in verse 6 of Proverbs 26, like cutting off one's feet or drinking violence is sending a message by the hand of a fool. Why would you listen to a message from a fool? 
like a lame man's legs, that, lang, that hang limp, is a proverb in the mouth of a fool. Like, trying, like tying a stone inside of a sling is giving honor to a fool. Like a thorn bush in a drunkard's hand is a proverb in the mouth of a fool. Like an, ang- like an archer who wounds at random is he who hires a fool or any passerby. As a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. Now, according to this, we're going to get to this next part. There's only one person more stupid than a fool. It says, do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is hope for a fool, more, even more hope for a fool than for him. You know who is even stupider than a fool? It's the people who listen to a fool. Go to Genesis chapter 9. And catch, catch, catch me when you get there. This is a Bible stuff. This is a Bible stuff study for you, and for anybody who wants to play around with the kingdom of God. The exit sign is is illuminated, and it is red. Where are you going if you don't know the way? It's red. You're going to hell if you don't get on the path. Those are, again. It's people who, who, who go to these traders online and get the advice from them, and then some people tolerate it in their ministries. Why would you tolerate that in your ministry? Oh, but, but are you being judgmental? Are you being legalistic? I'm not being legalistic. I'm being realistic. You know what the last day is called? Judgment day. It's going to get real judgmental. Genesis chapter 9. Genesis 9, verse, verse 20. It says, Noah... Uh, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard, and he drank some of its wine. He became drunk and uncovered inside of his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father naked and told his two brothers outside. You have the young brother who's gossiping. It says, but Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it across their shoulders. They walked backward and covered their father's naked body. You see, they wanted to cover their father's shame. Their faces were turned the other way and would not see their father's naked body. When Noah awoke from the wine and found out what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed is Canaan, the lowest of slave, he will be to the rest of his brothers. You know, we see a scripture here where a guy who just saved eight people, the entire world was destroyed except for eight people. And one of those eight people saw their leader in a little bit of sin. And it upset his heart, man, this guy just saved my life. Let me cover up his shame. Let me, let me, let me help him out. He goes, oh my gosh, you know what, the, you know what my leader did? He, he has sin. It's like so, some people. Do you want your sin list, your light and darkness study posted online? Is that a no or a yes? Because we got, it got a little too quiet for my liking. Which means there's a little bit more people affected by this hypocrisy than maybe anticipated. You don't want your sin posted online, so why do you want other people's? Because you're a hypocrite and you're hiding sin. It's always the people hiding sin who want to expose other people's sin. And here's, and here's, how, we know, here's how we know why. Is that person, people, people, tell me about the leader's sin. And I go, how are you going to help them? Crickets. You see, you can't even help him. And you want to know about his sin, so you're just a gossip. Deuteronomy chapter 13. You know, you know God is using these false prophets to test your heart, as he did in the Old Testament? Like, like don't tell me you can't stay away from some followers' Facebook posts. Don't tell me that you can't stay away from some false things being preached. I mean, I, 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 have been, I, have been, I have not lusted for over two years. I've not taken a second look at a woman for two years. Okay, if I can keep away from that, which is a, lot, a big temptation for men, you can stay away from these people who are not going to lead you to heaven. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1. It says of a prophet... Or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you by sign or wonder. And if the sign or wonder spoken takes place and the prophet says, let's follow other gods, gods you have not known, and let us worship them. You must not listen to the word of that false prophet or dreamer. 
The Bible says, the Lord your God is testing you. God is testing you. As Peter wanted, he was about to be sifted out by Satan. It's actually God who is trying to sift some of you out because you can't keep your eyes away from things you shouldn't look at. What got, what got Eve in the garden? Curiosity. I'm just curious about what's going on. I just want to know. Yeah, you don't want to confess your sin. Why, you want to know about somebody else's sin, but you can't confess your, your, your own? In John chapter 6, Jesus says, eat my flesh. We have the Johnsons in the house? I didn't even see you there. These are, these are heroes in the faith. I'm sorry. I just taken back. Andrew and Shamika in the house. I love these people. He, 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 he's awesome, this guy. Jesus says, eat my flesh, drink my blood. Did he go, you know, one day it's going to be communion. One day you're going to get it. He doesn't explain it, and many people fell away because of it. So he gave a little bit of information, and he didn't tell them all the rest. Some people can't wait till midweek. I need to know all the information right now. You would have fell away in Jesus' ministry. The Bible says, hold to my teachings, and then you'll know the truth. Not hold to my Facebook, and then you'll know some lies. You know who Saul was talking to before he made his biggest mistakes? He said to himself. He was talking to himself. I said to myself, I should do this. You know the crazy thing? All these people who have all this face, false stuff online, where are you, you cowards? Come and let's open up the word of God. Anybody in this room, you got issues? This is my family. We will open up the word of God together, and we will find out who has more scriptures. Because in this church, it is not I, it is not Jason Woody, it is not no man. This is the leader of our movement right here. I want to challenge you. Take responsibility. These, these two regions are incredible regions. They should be growing more. There's distraction in this church. Distraction from persecution and a little bit of people going, oh, I kind of, you know, it's kind of warranted. I've been through so much. You, you've been through a lot, but I've been through some stuff too. And the Paris church, full of former atheists, is still growing. You have zero excuse. Both of these regions should be growing even more. Again, you guys are incredible. I don't, I'm not down on you. You're incredible, but you can do even more. Where are you going if you don't know the way? Point number two. You know what happens when you don't know the way? You lose hope. We go to John chapter 6. You guys still with me? In yes. español, Juan capítulo 6, versículo 5. ¿Estás conmigo, mi gente? Sí. Estoy practicando. No. Practicando mi español también, porque para predicar en español es muy duro. Ahora yo, yo quiero mezclar los dos idiomas, porque en Francia estoy predicando en francés. Entonces aquí en Estados Unidos es muy duro para, para mí uh, para hablar en español y también uh, en inglés. That's all my Spanish that I have. John chapter 6, verse 5, it says, Jesus, he looked up and he saw a great crowd coming towards him. He said to Philip, shall, where shall we buy bread for those people to eat? He asked this only to test him. He already knew in his mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, eight months wages would not buy enough bread for each of these people to have even one bite. Now, bread represents what again? In the, the word of God. Jesus, gracias, hermano. My humble. It's bringing water to a thirsty soul. Thank you so much. It's the, it's, the, it's the word of God. It's Jesus Christ. Is there enough Jesus to go around for everybody? Yes. Philip was relying on himself. There's not enough Jesus for everybody. We keep going. This is another disciple who had a little bit more faith. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a little boy. I went into kids' class and I stole their food. 
It says here's a boy with five small barley loaves. Barley loaves, it's the same type of bread that was in 2 Kings chapter 4, barley loaves. Five barley loaves. And again, what does five represent? Again, it's the word of God for in, in this case. And I also have two fish. What does fish represent in the Bible? Yes. A lasso or actual disciples. So if you have the word of God and at least two disciples, okay, Okay, because at least two disciples to make a church. You don't listen to those fake people. I'm just, I'm just have church with my family, and I know we don't make any disciples, and I know I'm super bitter online, but I, I'm still a disciple. No, 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 no. Two disciples who disciple each other, and the Word of God. It says Jesus took the loaves, he gave thanks, and he distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. Again, more abundance, and he did the same with the fish. When they had enough to eat, in Greek, is they were filled up or they were satisfied. He said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing go to waste. So he gathered them, and there were 12 basketfuls, pieces of barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. And there was about 5,000 people that day. And what does the number 12 represent? 12 tribes of Israel or the 12 apostles, it represents the kingdom of God. So as long as you have the word of God and you have at least two disciples, you have the kingdom of God. And when you have the kingdom of God, you always have abundance in your life. You have hope in your life. You know, the Greek, the Greek word for, for hope is elpis. I know I can get corrected by my, my brother in the front row right there. He'll, he'll uh, incorrect uh, um, pronunciation. <laughs> and there's actually this, this uh, she's a, it's like a, a, um, a, a, um, a symbol of hope or a false god to the Greek people during that time. And it was a woman, and she was carrying a cornucopia full of stuff, like representing hope and abundance. And so you see Jesus not with just one basket, but 12 basketfuls of abundance. He was telling the people at that time, it is not in false gods that you should put your hope. Put your hope in me, the only way to heaven and to the kingdom of God. Yes. Satan wants to steal your hope. Yes. Satan wants to steal your hope. Yes. And one of the ways that he does that is through persecution. Have you ever been persecuted? Every hand should go up. The Bible says that anybody who wants to live a godly life will be persecuted. In Espanol, persecution. Persecution. See? Si? Yeah. You know, Cassidy and I, we, we were um, studying the Bible with an, uh, uh, a Muslim. And she ended up getting baptized. So she turned into an ex. My favorite kind of Muslim is an ex-Muslim. Yeah. Although I love, I still love all people. And so she becomes a disciple. And then her parents study the Bible and they become disciples. Yeah. They start getting persecution. They were getting death threats. So they both quickly fall away. And so then they start persecuting her. They even tried to kidnap her and choke her out and told her, you're not our daughter anymore if you go back to that church. She said, I'm going to be a women's ministry leader and I'm going back to that church. So she comes back to church. And then so they say, well, they're not, they're not going to give up. We're going to just send people to their house. And so people were showing up to our house at 1 in the morning, knocking on our door, trying to kick it down, saying, we're going to kill you. Is that, is that, doesn't that excite you? Does that fire you up? Little stories, recuerdos from the mission field. Memories from the mission field. And so we're there, we're getting death threats, and then people start falling away because of the death threats. And I'm like, tempted again. Am I going to lose hope? No, God is weeding out the fake disciples in my church. Thank you, God. I got even more hope. He's going to fix the, he's fixing the problem for me. And so then we, we talked to the, the owner of our apartment complex, or our apartment, and she tells me, and she's also a Muslim, and she says, you need to stop doing Bible studies in your apartment. I heard that you're singing songs, Christian songs in your apartment. And I said, I'm not going to give up on any of this. I will not cede my freedoms in Jesus Christ for you or anybody. She said, cede? That, those are like war words in French. I said, I am at war. I am at war for the souls of all mankind. Jesus is our only hope. If you want to kick us out, kick us out. She let up a little bit, but the, but the persecution didn't stop. Am I good on time? I just want to make sure, because the people start lining up in the back. I don't know. 
I'll make the last point. I'll keep it. I just want to, you know. So, you can tease, but, but seriously, uh, just between me and you, tease sign me at any time. If I, if I'm, if you need to. We started, we were baptizing in the river. We had three people that came to be baptized. It was incredible. My wife goes over to me, hey, maybe we should do all three baptisms at the same time. I go, ah, famous last words. <laughs> Never do this to your wife. Ah. <laughs> Whenever your wife tells you something, it says, please tell me one more time so I don't mess it up. <laughs> and so the first person gets baptized. They come out of the water, and immediately the police come over to us. The police come over to us, and then they're, like, talking to one of the disciples. One of the disciples with a big old smile points right at me, and I'm just like. <laughs> they, go, they go, who's the leader? And they go, that guy's the leader. And again, the temptation. Am I going to lose no hope? No. I go, there was one brother who was filming. I go, please film. If I go to jail, I'm going to jail for the glory of God. Put me, put me in the good news email. You film everything. So they pull us aside. And they go, who gave you the authority to do what you're doing? I say, well, could I be honest? Jesus Christ. <laughs> they go, why are you doing what you're doing? Because this is the only hope for mankind. Well, you need to stop doing this. I said, let me be honest with you. Either take us to jail or let us go. I will not stop preaching the word. After being detained for a couple of hours, they finally let us go. We waited a week, but then we came back the next week after that with five people, and we did all those five baptisms at the same time. I want to share about Sarah Bonamy. Sarah Bonamy is a sister who was in 13 hours of brain surgery. Her, her grandma died of cancer, her mom died of cancer, and she is presently battling with cancer. Sarah Bonamy, even when she has been in the hospital, never missed contribution. Sarah Bonamy, even while she's been in the hospital, shares her faith with 40 people online every single day. Sarah Bonamy used to be an atheist. When she came out of brain surgery, the first thing she did was drop a text. She put a thing in the, in, the, in the group chat for all the leaders. I am a miracle. From atheist to miracle in the kingdom of God. She says, Jesus is my only hope. And I just want to put before you today, again, there's so much garbage out there. You need to make the kingdom of God your only hope. Third and final point. You will never get to where you want to go if you don't know the way. You'll never get to where you want to go if you don't know the way. We read in verse 16 of John chapter 6. It says, When evening came, his disciples came down to him on, uh, on the lake. It says where they, were, where they got into a boat and set across the, the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed three or three and a half miles away, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, and he was walking on the water. They became terrified, but, said, but he said to them, It is I. Don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him in the boat, and then immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. You know, it's an interesting contrast from this scripture and the other scripture that you see in Matthew when Jesus is walking on the water. You know, Peter walks on the water in that time. And in this scripture, it says that they were heading in a direction, but they could not get to that destination until they did what? They accepted Jesus into the boat. They needed to accept Jesus into the situation that they were currently in, although it was dark, although it was rough. That's what the, the scriptures say. And so right now, I think there are people with dark and rough situations. I think there are situations where you need to accept Jesus fully into your life or he's going to block you. Jesus and his kingdom are undefeated. Whatever you truly want to do, I mean, we need millionaires in the kingdom of God. 
I mean, who's going to be the next millionaire? Who's the next person who's going who's gonna to start a new company that's just going to bless the entire, bless themselves and the kingdom? We need a couple of disciples with Rolls Royces and mansions in the hills. I mean, again, I love people in the ministry, but, but we got to, amen, there's going to be people, church leaders of thousands, but also people who have millions of dollars to bless the kingdom. The only way is through Jesus. You know, 40% of the church in Paris is former atheist, agnostic, or Muslim. And so we go out and we're sharing our faith one day and we find some, some good old-fashioned atheists. And so I go to the guy and I go, hey, I'd like to study the Bible. He goes, why do you want to study the Bible? <laughs> you do not need to be Christian to, uh, to do great things. I already have all the answers. And I go, you have all the answers? Okay, awesome. So what, what is the biggest problem in the world? I think racism is the biggest problem we have today. I said, awesome. I think racism is a big problem too. I want you to meet my friends. I'll go first and you go second. He goes, what do you mean? I'll, let you, I'll show you. Yeah, this is Kevin. He's a black guy. He hated Mexicans, also white people, okay, before. This is Guillaume. He hated immigrants and he hated black people. Okay, so this guy was a racist, this guy's a racist, and now all three of us are best friends. And also this racist guy is now married to a beautiful black woman. The kingdom of, the kingdom of God has cured racism. Now you go, Mr. Atheist. The demon started flying out of this guy. The kingdom of God is undefeated. Kevin now lead, he took over the leadership in the church of Paris. And Guillaume, who used to be an atheist, who used to be a racist, married to a black woman, is now the church leader in Brussels. I'll point you to one last scripture, and I'll close this out here. In John chapter 6, verse 30, Jesus just fed 5,000 people. Okay? Now, now check these people out. Check this out. He just fed 5,000 people. And then they go to him and they ask him, what sign will you give us so that we may believe you? What are you going to do? Bro, I just fed 5,000 people. You see, if Jesus' way is not good enough for you, nothing's good enough for you. You have seen baptism after baptism. You've seen leaders raised up. You've seen incredible miracles in this church. If Jesus is not good enough, nothing is good enough for you. I'll close out with the words from prophets and poets of The Greatest Showman and the song Never Enough. All the, all the shine of a thousand spotlights, all the stars we, that we can steal from the night sky will never be enough. Never be enough. Towers of gold are still too little. These hands could hold the world, but it'll never be enough. Never be enough for me. If Jesus' his way is not good enough for you, Nothing is. Where are you going if you don't know the way?